All right, let's go to Courtney in Daytona Beach. Courtney, what is up? Hi, how are you? I'm so good. Courtney, how are you? Good. I'm so excited to have this opportunity to speak with you. And me with you. Go for it. What's up? (laughs) Okay, so I need advice on how to tell my parents that I had a baby that I placed for adoption. And the backstory to that is in December of 2018, I was only 19 years old. Mm-hmm. I um, it was very unexpected. I found out as I was having him. And so we decided that the best, the best route would be adoption. And that has worked out absolutely beautifully. I can't complain about that at all. But now I'm kind of stuck in a place where I think I really need to tell them in order to keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. But my boyfriend isn't as open with it. And so I don't want to really be too disrespectful against, like, his wishes on the topic. So I'm really, like, stuck. Wow, there's a lot there. Okay, so number (laughs) one, thank you for calling. Let's unpack this a little bit. So a couple years ago, you had a baby. You placed it for adoption. And you carried the baby full term, placed it to adoption. And the baby's doing well. Are you still in contact with the adoptive parents? Or is your baby... I have a... Okay. No, I have a great relationship. I talk to her probably once a week, if maybe two weeks, but we have a very good relationship. Wow, how remarkable. And they're good folks, good parents, and you feel wonderful about your baby being there? Yes, I have. And my view on it is this was meant to happen. That's just how everything's worked out very well on mm. my side of it. That's that's incredible. Okay, so is this boyfriend you have, the is that the father of this child? Or is yes. it some, somebody new? Okay, so y'all are still together. Yes. How long is, have y'all been together? Um, three years in December. Three years. Okay, and so why aren't you married yet? Why haven't you just said, dude, this is, this is the guy, let's just call it? I don't know. We've honestly talked about it, but... <laughs> I, I don't know. Has, I don't know. To, I think it really has to do with me because I'm like, I'm teeny young, this and that. Mm-hmm. But I have a bunch of, I guess, qualifications of what I think I need to be before I could be married. Is what it is. Name some of them for me. I honestly want my debt paid off, which I know is like you can do it together. But I also, I'm not even. I'm only 20 now. He's a little bit older. Okay. I feel like you need a house first. I need to be in the position to buy a house together. Okay. Just little stuff like that, which I know isn't true, but that's what I think hinders it. So those things are all real, but you've kind of knocked everything out of order because you have those three things, and then you have a kid, right? And so y'all, yeah. y'all, y'all went out of order there. Um, yeah. And so as a couple, y'all have experienced a lot of things that most couples experience after they've committed to one another for the rest of their lives. How did he feel about this adoption? Um, he kind of, you know, he was very supportive and he was there for me and he still has been. But I think over time, it's been harder for him than it has been for me. Like I've coped with it very well and he, I don't think has, like it's, we don't really talk about it. It's kind of uncomfortable to talk about with him, hmm. which it's like kind of makes me sad because I find it to be such a happy thing. Like if, it, you know, if it had to happen, take the find the joy in it right. and kind of go with it. And I feel like for him, it's a little bit harder. How is he struggling? What does harder mean? I just, he doesn't talk about it. Like I'll get pictures printed out or I got like in, in preparation of telling my parents, I ordered a photo book and I was like, here you go. That's one step closer. And I, he still hasn't looked at it. And it's, mm. I think it's just hard because he's about, he's his um, late twenties. So I think it's for him, it's more like I should have been ready. Yeah. I should have been at the age type of thing. Yeah. So he is probably experiencing quite a bit of shame. I had a, yeah. I had a child and in my mid to late twenties, and I wasn't, quote unquote, man enough to take care of that kid. I, yeah, I think that's exactly what it is, because he also doesn't reach like he's we're all friendly with the parents, but he doesn't go out of his way to like reach out to them. He, his mm-hmm. thing is, you know, if they want to talk to me, they can send me a message. It's not like in a bad way, but I think it is. He just doesn't like to. That sounds pretty immature. What I mean, that, can't do. yeah, that sounds pretty immature for somebody who created a human. Right. Um, and again, that goes that's the responsibility of hooking up is. The result is you could have a human life, right? And then you've got to be able to deal with that, right? So, yeah, it sounds like he's going through a lot. Here's here's my thought here. Um, So he's – how long did you say he's 28? Yeah. Okay, so I want to back out. A 26-year-old hooked up with an 18-year-old, and y'all had a kid. And 
I don't want to minimize the the magic love making experience that a 26 year old and an 18 year old are going through. But y'all hooked up and you had a kid, and you did a noble and remarkable thing, and you blessed a family with that beautiful baby. And they're doing great, and you are able to see that for the blessing that it is. Good for you. When it comes to telling your parents, you're not married to this dude. Y'all have been dating for a while. You're not married to this guy, and so I'm going to tell you he didn't get a vote. And if this secret between you and your family is hanging there like a giant weight around your neck, um, which I'm confident that it is, it's my opinion that, that secrets kill people. They drown people. And I would recommend talking to your folks. There's not going to be a cute way to do this or a, um, a you know, like making a book. or try- This isn't going to be a, a fun, beautiful conversation. This is going to be one of those conversations that you – let your parents know ahead of time, we need to have a hard talk and that we're going to have a hard conversation. And I'm going to need you and mom, like mom and dad, need y'all to be direct and paying attention to me. And then we're going to go have breakfast somewhere and just let them know. I want you to know they're going to be devastated. They're going to be heartbroken. Not that there is a grandkid that they don't know about. That will be a thing. Here's what they're going to be devastated about. That their baby girl went through something so hard and they weren't there for them. But they were there for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I've I've spoken to some of my older siblings about it, and they mm-hmm. said the same thing. They're like, they're not going to be mad at you. Because I was like, are they going to be mad? And they're like, no, they're going to be, you know, probably disappointed or upset that they didn't find out sooner. Yeah, they're going to be disappointed that they didn't walk with you through this journey, right? It's a magical transformation, and then a, then the babies, all the stuff, right? And they're going to probably say things like, well, we would have helped, and... Now they're going to deal with somebody else raising, in their mind, their grandkid, right? And yeah. that their teenage daughter had to make this heavy, heavy decision all on their own. Um, but here's the thing. It is what it is. So I want you to not go into this conversation with any sort of fantasy, any sort of mythological, there's going to be confetti come down, everybody's going to hug, and they're going to... You know, I, it's just going to be a hard conversation. Gear yourself up for it. But the hard conversation is still the right conversation. And it sounds yeah. like you're tired of the secret. And I'm telling you right now, is no matter how hard this conversation goes, you're going to feel a burden lifted off your heart and your soul. It's definitely hard. I feel like I'm living like two lives because I get pictures, I get updates, and it's like I – yeah, as of right now, it's like I can't share that with them, and I find so much joy in it. So That's I feel exactly like they right. would in a way too to know that – I, I I did make the right choice because I have such an involvement still, and it's not like I made this decision and then I never heard about it again. That's right. Um, would would your adoptive parents are they open to your parents visiting? Or um, the, are we, you all just? We've kind of discussed it, and she left it. The mom left it to if if um, he ever asked about them. Okay. He would, he would be the one to do it. She wouldn't want to push it on him. Okay. I think that's really wise and good good for her. Yeah, it looks like you picked a wonderful family. So <laughs> the challenge for your parents is they're going to want to see the baby, and they're going to want to see their likeness represented in their grandkids. They're, there's just going to be a piece of their heart out running around in the universe that they can't see and hug and touch, right? And so yeah. just know that's going to be hard, but also know that it's, again, it's the right conversation to have. And so I here, here's the steps in order. Number one, I would let them know ahead of time. Don't just show up at their house one afternoon and drop a bomb on them. Let them know, hey, we need to have a hard conversation, and I'm going to come to your house, and we're going to do this, or we're going to go get pancakes together, and we're going to have this hard conversation. You know what they're going to think? They're going to think that you're pregnant now, and they're going to think that you need to have a quick shotgun wedding with this older guy that they may or may not like. They're not going to be expecting that you already had a baby, and the baby is one and a half or two years old and doing well with an adoptive family. So you're going to surprise them. Understand they're going to be heartbroken. They're going to, they're going to cry. And that doesn't mean what you did is, is not the right thing. And then be willing to be willing to heal that relationship with your parents. They're going to feel like they let you down. They're going to feel like you let them down. It's just going to be messy. It's just going to be messy. And messy and hard doesn't mean it's the wrong thing. You're going to have to grieve this with your parents. Here's the deal. Your parents had a picture in their head of what the grandkid was going to be like, the first grandkid, and they've imagined it. They're going to imagine themselves of buying all this shenanigans for this baby, right, and coming over, and and they're going to have to reframe their picture. They're going to have to grieve it. They're going to have to grieve this 
this this new world that they're in, that you're going to just drop on them at a Denny's at nine o'clock on some Saturday morning. You're going to have to grieve a new relationship with your parents. You're also going to have to grieve a transitioning relationship with this guy. You're 20. He's 28. He's almost got a decade on you. At some point, you're going to have to decide this is the guy for me or not. He's going to have to deal with the grief of his child. Um, He's going to have to deal with the grief of, um, I should have been there. I should have raised my own kid, and I didn't. Um, And that doesn't mean that was the wrong thing, but he's going to have his own thoughts. And the more he hides from that stuff, the deeper that wound's going to get, the more that infection's going to fester, and it's just going to end up spraying all the people he loves too. So he's going to have to do his own work. And so I keep talking about the first two calls here. I've talked about grief, and I've talked about grief, and I've talked about grief. Really quickly, um, let's talk about grief for a second. Kubler-Ross came up with this model years and years ago, um, back in the late 60s, early 70s. She wrote this book on death and dying, and it was really a discussion. This book was a discussion of the five stages of grief she came up with, and they are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So when somebody dies in your life, you deny it, then you get angry, you get pissed off, and then you start bargaining with God, you start bargaining with the people around you, I'll be nicer if, and then you go through this depression, you just get through the, in that black hole of grief that if anyone is, if you've lost somebody, you know what I'm talking about. And then you get to the acceptance stage where you start to rebloom, you start to regrow, and you just realize this is what this is. And we often think about, you know, death. That's the thing that we grieve, right? Kubler-Ross, the, these stages were initially designed for people who weren't grieving the losses of loved ones or broken relationships. It was written for, it was designed for people who were grieving their own impending death. She was with people who were dying. And then in 2019, David Kessler, who was who studied with her, I think he was one of her research assistants, he wrote one of my top five most important books of my life. He wrote, um, it's called Finding Meaning. The sixth stages of grief. And we'll put that in the show notes here. Um, We'll put both these books in the show notes. But if you have to pick up one book over the next few months, pick up Finding Meaning by David Kessler, especially in these times. It's a remarkable book on grief is so much bigger than somebody's dying or you died. Grief is about any sort of what you thought was going to happen is not going to happen right? You thought you were going to be an astronaut. It didn't work out that way. You thought you were going to meet some romantic prince and he turned out to be an abusive jerk. You thought that my picture of my first grandkid is going to be this, we're going to hold this baby and it's going to be an easy birth and my daughter's going to be healthy and she's going to, the father of this child is going to be this wonderful guy and he's going to be there. And then all of a sudden you find out that your first grandkid was adopted underneath you. You didn't know. And it's somewhere else. All of those things are grief. It's just that the picture you thought was going to be your tomorrow has changed. And the longer we go through life not acknowledging that, the more it festers within us. There becomes a gap, and we fill that gap with all kinds of addictive behaviors, busyness, numbing behaviors, drinking, all kinds of crazy things we run around, right? And so what Kessler brings to the the table here is after acceptance – Right after you just make peace with it, that's not enough. There's this next step, this sixth step, and that is, what are you going to do as a result of, right? Are you going to become an advocate for adoptive families? Are you going to be an advocate for parents having great relationships with their teenage kids so that they feel safe to come home and talk to you? Are you going to become somebody who is really involved in AA because you lost a loved one to alcoholism or drug abuse, whatever the thing is, how are you going to make meaning? How are you going to transform your heart and the hearts of those around you because you went through this, right? And an important thing about these stages is they're not linear, right? Sometimes people die and you get angry and then you deny it. And then you go into the black hole or somebody passes away and you go into the black hole or you just randomly get dumped and whoosh, you feel like you have just been stuck underwater, right? Eventually, you begin to breathe again if you've got people walking alongside you. Eventually, you get to exhale again. The sun comes up. The buds that were broken off begin to, begin to bloom. The, the world turns green again. And here's the thing. Here's a great quote from this, this Kessler book. Here's a, here it is. When we are grieving, we want to stay in the harbor. 
It's a good place to be for a while. It's where we refuel, rebuild, repair. But in the same way ships are meant to sail, we are meant to eventually leave our safe harbor to take the risk of loving again, to find new adventures, to live a life after loss, and maybe even to help another, right? This is what finding meaning is, is about. This is what stopping. We thought 2020 was going to be this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing. It's not. I thought I was going to get to have this awesome new job promotion and, and I'm not. I'm homeschooling my kid. I've got a bandana on that I take off just for this Zoom meeting and then I put it back on. I'm, I've just got to grieve what I thought was going to be so that I can come to the present and deal with what's now. And then over time, I'm going to accept where I'm at. I'm going to sometimes bite down on my mouthpiece and just go in swinging. Other times I'm going to let the things go that I can't control. And over time, we're going to make meaning. We're going to make meaning and we're going to continue to live the story the best way that we can. So thank you so, so much for that call, Courtney. I'll be thinking about you. I would love, 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 Courtney, call me back after that, that conversation with your folks. If all three of you want to call me back, I'd love to talk to your parents too. I want to hear how that conversation goes. I want to hear how y'all work together to make a plan for tomorrow.